Hi, I'm Alison and I'm on the community team at the Heath Business and Technical Park in Runcorn. And today I have got a story that's special to me to read to you. Now, I'll have to read chapters of it because it's quite long. It's 14 chapters, but I'll start off with the first one today. And I'm very honoured to be reading it. It's called The Bungee Venture. It's out of print now, in fact, I think it was published in 1977. Now, you're not allowed to read somebody else's story because this is their work, and this is Stan McMurtry's work. He used to be a cartoonist in the Daily Mail. But I wrote to their publishers, who are Cress Rules. Come on then, Neil. Cress Rules Publishing Company um, in Colwall, and the most, in, I think it's Herefordshire, and the most lovely man, Simon, emailed me back and said, yes, I will give you permission to read this book. I grew up with it in my childhood. Love the story. And as long as we don't make profit out of it and at the Heath, we, we, we will not. This is for you to enjoy. I'm just going to have to let Neil out my cat. Hold on, let me just show you. Neil, I'll have to turn the stand around. There he is. Shall we let you out, Neil? <clears throat> Sorry about this. This is about take number 23, so I'm not starting again. Right, there you go, children. There you go. Right, where were we? So, <coughs> to give you a little cute clue, the bungee venture. It's about a mad inventor. The mad inventor, Mr. Winsborough, wants to build a time machine. And you'll see in the first chapter that he, he builds his time machine, but something goes wrong. He has two children called Andy and Karen, and uh, he also has a wife, Mrs. Winsborough. And it causes problems because something happens and the children have to rescue him. And on page 35, they meet a creature who I think you'll really like. Hope you do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chapter one. The great silver orb stood gleaming on the cluttered workbench. It balanced precariously on one stout metal leg. A mass of multicoloured wires and tubes wormed their way like tangled spaghetti from points to sockets around one side and a long antennae sprouted from the top, just like two ears alert to catch the smallest sound. Mr Winsborough placed his screwdriver down on the bench and mopped his brow with an oily handkerchief. He stood back a pace and admired his handiwork. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, he murmured, and then glancing heavenwards, this time, this time, please let it work this time. He picked up a crumpled blueprint from an untidy heap of blueprints littering the floor and started to check systematically every valve, every screw, every wire and plug. And two hours later, he sat back tired but satisfied on a wooden box, which he used as a stool and lit up his ancient pipe. It did nothing to calm his excitement. The time for testing was here. The time when he would know whether the months of working and planning and putting up with all the family jokes had been worthwhile. Ah, well, best get on with it, he thought. And climbing over the piles of bolts and nuts and discarded machinery, which were piled high on the garage floor, he went into the house. Mrs. Winsborough and the children were in the lounge watching television. It was early evening and a a western, a cowboy film, was in full swing. Mrs. Winsborough was plump and had a jolly face with big blue eyes. She was also a little bit absent-minded. The scarf that she was knitting was already about two and a half metres long. I have to change it, it says 10 feet here, but this is 1977. About two and a half metres long, but it didn't really matter. She just enjoyed knitting. Probably the scarf would go on and on and on until someone hinted that maybe they'd like a jumper or a pair of socks and then she'd drop the scarf and knit an enormous jumper with sleeves that went on and on and on and on. Her eyes never left the television. 
but her fingers just knitted on independently. Karen and Andrew were bright, cheerful children. She was 14 and madly keen on horses, uh, records and a spotty face boy at school and her brother Andy was 12 years old and was fascinated by anything mechanical like motorbikes, television sets, also food, reading, not washing and staying in bed in the morning. The interest in mechanical things had been fostered by his dad. For years they'd been happy together both tinkering about with car engines or mending the television but suddenly Mr. Winsborough had started inventing things. His every spare moment was spent in the garage or at the kitchen table, drawing plans or experimenting with electrical apparatus. Now, so far his inventions included a contraption for taking the top off a boiled egg, which went wrong on his first attempt and pounded the egg and the egg cup and a bit of the dining room table into small pieces. Then came a mechanical stirring spoon which clipped onto the side of a saucepan and automatically stirred the contents which performed beautifully until one day it fell into the saucepan and the soup was served to guests at dinner with bits of metal cocks and screws mixed with the vegetables and taste a bit of lubricating oil. Mr Winsborough had been convinced that he'd make his fortune with his next brainwave, the automatic dog brusher. And he'd hoped to demonstrate his invention at Cruft's dog show. The family didn't have a pet dog, so on the day of the test, he'd borrowed their next door neighbor's miniature poodle. The poodle was strapped into the device and the more automatic brushes were set in motion. Now, if Mr. Winsborough hadn't just been called off to the phone at that moment and if Mrs Winsborough hadn't picked up her knitting and settled down to watch her play on the telly then they wouldn't have had the embarrassment of having to hand back to their next door neighbour a completely bald poodle. I have been plagued with sheer bad luck said Mr Winsborough when his wife and children gently teased him about his inventions. You wait and see, one day I shall be famous for my inventions. One day when we're rich, then you'll regret teasing me. And so it had gone on. A lawn mower that mowed the lawn on its own, and incidentally the flower beds as well. An engine which ran on ginger beer. A bed which tipped over at eight o'clock in the morning, thus saving the necessity of buying an alarm clock. And many, many more gadgets. Then suddenly, Mr Winsborough, had become even more busy in the garage. He locked the door behind himself and no one was allowed in or near the place. Little things from the house had a tendency to disappear mysteriously. The bread bin lid vanished without trace one day. A metal post which held up the corner of the car park port outside also disappeared and the flex from the lamp in the hall went the same way. It was very baffling and also annoying that they were not allowed into the secret, but they learned to put up with it and had become used to the fact that they hardly ever saw Mr Winsborough, except at breakfast times. Occasionally, though, he would take Andrew and Karen down to the library with him, where he'd spend hours leafing through heavy scientific books, making lots of notes and muttering things like, oh, oh, oh. Ah, my goodness, so, aye, of course, to himself. And then all their questions and pleas about his latest project, he'd only answer, you'll see, my dears, you'll see. And see, they did that day. And extremely excited, Mr Winsborough burst into the lounge, his head smeared with oil from his oily handkerchief and his pipe upside down in his mouth, dropping hot ash onto the carpet. I've finished, he cried it triumphantly waving his arms in the air. The greatest invention the world has ever known. I have invented something so incredible, so staggering, that it will astonish and baffle the world's greatest scientists. You'll be wanting a cup of tea than I expect, Mrs Winsborough said, not even looking up from the screen. Tea? This is no time for tea, roared 
Mr. Winsborough. I'll tell you, you're about to see history in the making. He grabbed his wife by the hand and he pulled her up out of the chair and towards the door. The children had already leapt up enthusiastically and were waiting outside the garage door, bubbling over with curiosity. Hold on, my dears, said Mr. Winsborough, unlocking the garage door. Your months of patience are about to be rewarded, your every question answered. He threw open the door with a flourish and helped his wife over the piles of discarded machinery that were all over the floor. Then he waved his hand in a grand gesture at his latest creation and said, There, what do you think? They stirred in open-mouthed astonishment at the great globe standing on the workbench. Its mass of coloured wires and all the rest of the silver painted, pinned and bolted paraphernalia which made up the weird object that Mr. Winsborough had called his greatest invention in the world. It was some minutes before anybody spoke. And then, here, isn't that my bread bin lid? said Mrs. Winsborough, stepping forward and examining a piece of metal that was welded onto the side of the structure. Daddy, Daddy, that's one of my horse's stirrups, wailed Karen, prodding a finger at another lump of metal stuck to the top. Hey, my bicycle pump, yelled Andy. I wonder where that had gone. Protruding, protruding from the side of the machine was a, blank, a bank of three piston-like objects, one which was definitely a bicycle pump. Enough, enough cried Mr. Winsborough. How can you worry about such trivialities at a time like this? History is about to be made. The whole scientific world about to be shaken to the core. And all you can think and worry about is bread bin lids and bicycle pumps and stirrups, said Karen. It's a peculiar looking machine, said Andy. What's it, what's it supposed to do? Karen scratched her head thoughtfully. I, I know, she said. I bet it's a pop music machine. You, you, you press a button and you get non-stop music all day. Mr. Winsborough glanced heavenwards and muttered so softly under his breath. Mrs. Winsborough clapped her hands together excitedly. Oh, it's an automatic tea maker! The expression on Mr. Winsborough's face made it clear that it was definitely not an automatic tea maker. It's just a heap of old junk, said Andy. This, said Mr Winsborough, through clenched teeth, is my time machine. Time machine, they all echoed. What? Do you mean to say it's just a clock, said Mrs Winsborough. Not that kind of time machine. Silly, said Mr Winsborough. He reached up to the side of the machine and pulled on a small brass handle, which Mrs Winsborough instantly recognised as being the handle that had been missing for weeks from the kitchen cupboard door. Excuse me, I've got to let Neil in, the cat. Come on in. In you come. In you come, properly. There you go, Dan. I don't know why, but he won't use his cat flap. Come on. Where am I? See, I've lost my place now. Oh, there we go. A small door opened in the side of the machine. And Mr. Winsborough, come on, Mr. Winsborough hopped with surprising agility up onto the workbench. He squeezed through the door, he squeezed through the door and sat down inside this globe, balanced on one leg on the workbench. And he sat on a wooden seat inside it, it was a very tight fit. Pressed against his stomach was a stout wooden board onto which was fitted rows and rows of switches and bulbs and dials and levers. He looked down at their incredulous faces and smiled. Oh, let me tell you how this all started, he said. I think you'd better, said Mrs Winsborough. But hurry, we're, we're missing a lovely play on the television. About 18 months ago, said Mr Winsborough, ignoring her. I got a book from the library which was really fascinating. It was by a man called H.G. Wells and it was called The Time Machine. It was all about a man who invented a marvellous time machine in which he could travel through time, forwards into the future or back into history. It was really intriguing. It meant that a man didn't have to rely on the history books 
but could actually go back in time and check out the facts for himself. Mr. Winsborough sucked excitedly on, excitedly on his pipe and two great clouds of smoke filled the dome top of his great invention in which he was sitting. Of course, it was only a book and uh, an exciting yarn, a figment of the author's imagination. And when I'd finished reading it, I put it down and I forgot about it for a while. But then, one day, Karen asked me to help her with her history homework. And there was a question that I could not answer. I suddenly, it suddenly occurred to me how marvellous it would be if a machine such as H.G. Wells's had described really existed. Well, once the thought were in my mind, I couldn't get rid of it. And so I started about thinking about a method of making solid substances disintegrate and travel through time. It'd take too long to explain exactly how it works, uh, but put it simply, it means travelling along through a beam of light. Well, I've never heard anything so ridiculous in my life, said Mrs Winsborough. Travel through time, indeed. It's not possible. But it is possible, exploded Mr Winsborough. And I shall prove it. Mrs Winsborough folded her ample arms across her chest, leant against the garage door and stared at her husband. She didn't have to say anything. She didn't have to. Her whole attitude said what they were all thinking. Go on, prove it. Mr Winsborough frowned determinedly, settled himself with a wriggle firmly into his seat and started switching switches, pressing buttons on the panel before him. Little green and red bulbs lit up above his head. A loud humming noise started from somewhere below the seat. He reached forward. He picked up two small plugs which were attached to wires which trailed under the panel. He pushed the plugs into his ears, then reached behind him. He pulled a sort of a belt, study seat belt, around his chest and clicked it into a socket in the wall. All right, where would you like me to go? He said, glaring down at the unbelievers below. Oh, go forward, a f go forward in time a few days, said Mrs Winsborough. Bring back next week's wage packet, she said. I'm a bit short. I I I'm learning about the dinosaurs at school, said Andy. Go back to the days when dinosaurs were alive and then come back and tell us all about it. Right, oh, said Mr Winsborough. Now, let's see now. That'll be about 120 million years ago. OK. He turned a small pointer around on a dial in front of him. The dial was marked off in units of a million, one to a hundred. Next to that was another dial marked off in thousands and another in hundreds, then another two more in tens and single units. Beside all these dials was a huge lever. Above the lever was printed the word past and below the lever was printed the word future. He pressed the lever up towards past. Instantly, the machine started to vibrate really violently. The humming noise changed to a high-pitched whine and blue and yellow electrical flashes sparked furiously between the two antennae on the roof of the globe. Mrs Winsborough stepped forward anxiously. Oh, be careful, dear, she cried. Doesn't look safe standing on just that one leg. Indeed, the machine was shaking so violently it looked as if it might just fall off the workbench. Don't worry, shouted Mr Winsborough above the noise. Here I go. He stabbed his finger down on the large red button in the panel and closed the door with a slam. Bang! Too big a slam. The machine, already lurching and vibrating, seemed to feel the bang of the door just as a tired boxer feels a hard blow to the body. Slowly, the machine keeled over sideways, thudded over onto the workbench, scattering tools everywhere, then crashed down onto the garage floor where it lay, shuddering like a stricken animal. Two great puffs of smoke belched out from its side, the whine of the engine stopped, and then it lay still. Mrs Winsborough and the children rushed forward, horrified. Karen grasped the door handle and tried to pull it open. There was a blinding flash, and then an almighty bang. The machine exploded. All three of them were hurled through the air in a welter of bolts and nuts and bits of wire to thud painfully against the wall of the garage. They scrambled up again in panic and fear tearing at the wreckage littered round them. 
Arthur, Arthur, are you all right? screamed Mrs. Winsborough. Daddy, shouted the children. They rushed across to the workbench where the smoking and broken husk of the machine now lay and then around the garage frantically searching and calling. But although they searched the garage, the small garage, for two more hours of Mr. Winsborough, there was not the slightest trace. Okay, I'll record chapter two next. Meanwhile, as a good friend, a librarian said to me about Harry Potter many years ago, she said, Alison, you might not like the start of this book. It's a new one by this um, J.K. Rowling, Rowling, who knows how to say her name. And she said, um, it's really, really good. And if you stick with it, just stick with it for the first five chapters and then see how it goes. You might just like it. And I'm glad I did stick with Harry Potter. And it turned out to be a fab book. Now, I'm not saying this is Harry Potter, but give it a few more chapters, especially till chapter until page 35, where we get to meet that special friend. Okay, bye for now. I'm going to go and see what Neil, my cat, wants. Bye for now.